All right, there he is, one of my all-time favorites, one of my longest guests, and one of the most expert guys I know on all the issues that he writes about that I just, of course, told you about. Tim Wise, happy end of summer, uh, beginning of school year, and I think I need to, I, I don't know, do I congratulate you? I think you said, and maybe this is not for air, but you're an empty nester, you and your wife. We are. Our, yeah, our, my wife and I are actually sans children at Are this you point. okay? Uh, I know you're close with your girls. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm we're both super excited for them. I mean, it's a it's a definite adjustment. I think anyone who is a parent and, you know, is is in the house with these kids, you know, because my wife and I both work from home. And so we're really around a lot. Even when I travel, I'd be around a lot if I wasn't on the road. And so you're really seeing them every day yeah. for 21 years, yeah. constantly, all the time. Um, and when they go you know, little things are weird. Like my, my, my wife and I go to, we shop for groceries separately because we like different stuff. So she goes to one place and I go to oh, another. Yeah, the first that's time, funny. yeah, I do too. The first time she went grocery shopping after we got our, our youngest moved in uh, to college, she said it was so weird, you know, trying to shop and not have to think about what the kids want, you know, like, Oh, I don't have to, I don't have to shop for them. And it was sort of bittersweet. Like it was a sort of melancholy moment. And then I went shopping and I had sort of the same thing. So you know, it's weird. It's a little bit of an adjustment, but we just had a vacation. My wife and I was great. Um, you know, it was fun. And uh, so, yeah, it's good. That's great. It's I mean, you, you're going to have to show me the way. Uh, Ava is a senior and is going to be uh, yeah. most likely off to college next year. And uh, I've, I've got uh, already a little bit of anxiety. I should say a lot about it. By the way, I my wife and I shop separately. She shops for her and the girls, generally speaking. I mean, she'll get me anything I want. But the, the difference is that I like uh, salt and sugar. <laughs> she's so healthy i have to go get like breaded chicken on my own uh yeah because i mean she'd get it but i i am embarrassed to ask i think i think that's the truth actually yeah. i don't want to say out loud get me salt and vinegar potato chips <laughs> right, uh, I understand. lots of talk with you about let's get to the the least consequential but but kind of most fun and maybe you'll find a way to say that this is a more important issue. And, and I don't think I've seen you write a, you know, an essay about it specifically. I've seen a couple of tweets, which is, I think, important. But this, this, this little or maybe large controversy about the casting of, uh, of a black actress to play a, a mermaid, a fish person, in a live action yeah. version of, of The Little Mermaid. There's been a little hay may of it. I haven't seen it. I, I don't know how big of a deal is it, it is, but I'm, is it large? Is it? emblematic of a larger issue what are what are the whites struggling with here <laughs> what are the whites struggling? That, that that should probably be the question that we ask every day that we wake <laughs> up what are the whites struggling with today um you know this has been going on a while right i mean th this happened when uh the hunger games movie came out many years ago and rue the character rue was uh was a black actress of course in the book as the author pointed out when all these white folks flipped out about Rue being black, she's like, she, she was always black. Y'all didn't pick that up that the district she was from was a district where most of the people were of color. Y'all didn't, y'all didn't get that in the book. So she was black the whole time, but people lost their mind, you know? Uh, and that happens whenever, you know, anyone is recasting the same thing happened with Annie, you know, Annie is a, is a, is a blind redhead. You can't make her black. You can't have daddy Warbucks be black. You, you know, and and again, these are fictional characters. So the fa and in the case of Little Mermaid, it is a fucking fish person like that is what Ariel is. So if you can if you can handle the thought of a fish person getting actual legs to marry a prince after defeating the sea witch. Right. But you can't. But that person's got to be a ginger because only gingers have fins. Yeah. You know, I mean. As, as as the dad of a redhead, we will both tell you gladly to to just to just fuck right off if that's really something that you're gonna trip about. Especially considering, as I mentioned on Twitter, that the same people that are upset about Ariel being black, they didn't have any problem with the overly stereotypical crab character who sounds like the worst impersonation of a Jamaican ever. Like it's completely <laughs> fine that the crab is like, oh man, yeah, you know, oh, it's Ariel. bad. Oh, your dad is going to whatever. And it's just like the craziest over the top, you know, stereotypical Jamaican accent. It's fine for the crab to sound like that, um, but it's not OK for Ariel to be to be black. Um, and, and as I've also pointed out, the same people that are flipping about, you know, black characters in what were traditionally, quote unquote, considered white roles. 
these people don't seem to 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 mind the representation of a white Jesus on all their churches and their glass <laughs> windows on the Christmas cards, even though Jesus most certainly wasn't white. So when they complain about that. Um, then maybe I'll listen to them complain about, you know, Ariel or Captain Marvel. I did Marvel not see White whatever. Jesus coming right there. I didn't see it. I thought you were going to say any number of other things. But that is, of course, the ultimate <laughs> good yeah. point. Uh, OK, now on to some more important things. I feel like of of, of the writers and, and analysts and, and experts that I read, you're one of the harshest and least forgiving of the MAGA movement which makes me feel like I prop. I, I think I'm almost entirely agree with with it, and you know, and it's not. I don't think you know it's because of how we communicate on Twitter or or your writing. I mean, I think that you make some really important points about how these folks need to be dealt with. Uh, but it's hard yeah. if they're your coworkers or your friends. Or your family, but that's not necessarily what you're saying either. You're talking about when they break the law, when they do this or that. This is this is how we need to react to them. Yep. So without pointing out any specifics of some of the things that you've been saying, talk to me about how you feel about a lot of these folks. Uh, specifically, I think you talk a lot about those who raided the Capitol on January 6th. Yeah, I mean, you know, Joe Biden referred to them as, as a semi-fascist movement, and I, I think he was being kind, as as he often tries to be, um, and ecumenical by putting the word semi in front of fascist. But I also think he was underselling it in the sense that really what the, the MAGA movement is about, and especially that sort of foot soldier grassroots level movement, um, the types that go to the rallies, the types that were at the January 6th insurrection um, they're not just fascist, even though their their politic is that, but they're terrorist uh, under whatever definition you want to look at the U.S. code definition. You want to look at the you know Center for Strategic and International Studies definition, which I mentioned in one of the pieces that I wrote on Medium recently. You want to look at the State Department's definition, yeah. just about any definition of terrorism is going to be one that those folks fit. That doesn't mean that everybody that voted for Trump is a terrorist or semi-fascist, but the MAGA movement, the real hardcore movement folks are indeed terrorists uh, under just about any interpretation of that term. They are deliberately trying to sow fear and terror to gain political ends through violence or the threat of violence. And so when you say things like, well, you know, uh, Civil War 2.0 just touched off because they raided our emperor gods, you know, tacky palace in Florida. So now we got to I'm getting my ammunition ready. Like, what the hell is that? You know, obviously, that is an attempt to intimidate when you have somebody try to storm the FBI building in Cincinnati. And rather than denounce it, what did the MAGA leadership, uh, what did Trump and all of the sort of big MAGA voices say? They, they didn't say anything. They tried to say it was a false flag. They tried to say it was it was it was all fabricated, that he wasn't really a Trump supporter. And then the true social, you know, social media website that Trump owns and runs until it you know goes into bankruptcy this week or whatever, uh, scrubbed this guy's account, didn't want it to anybody to see it. So they got rid of it so they could you know have some kind of plausible deniability. But that's that's who these people are. And so when I say I want to see them locked up and I've gotten some pushback from other you know people on the left about this, and I'm going to write something about it, because, you know, in general, as is the case for most of us on the left, we don't believe in the carceral state. We really don't want to see more prisons and more people incarcerated. But the difference between a typical criminal uh, or, or criminal offender, I should say, I don't want to label people as criminals. A typical offender, whether it's a violent crime or a property crime or whatever, are, are the types of crimes that have very specific and preventable sociological sources, right? Whether we're talking about economic conditions, whether we're talking about impulsivity and things that are psychological things that can be addressed and, and people can get help with. But when you're talking about terroristic fascist activity, this is like the most premeditated kind of criminal activity. You know, I can, I, you can take someone who's an offender who, you know, is, is stealing to support their habit, for instance. And if you get them clean, and get them the treatment and the rehab that they need. They're not going to keep offending. But someone who actually believes in overthrowing democracy, what do I do for them by the time that they're 40 or 50 years old and, and they're attacking the capital? Yeah. Do you think that, like, I'm going to be able to sit in a restorative justice circle with them and have some conversation where we figure it out together? I don't think that's going to work with that kind of person. So if you get to the point where you're engaging in terrorist activity, yeah, I think you need a bunkie and three hots and a cot for a long time. And doesn't have to mean, you know, 
cruelty and throw you in a cell in solitary confinement. I don't believe in that. But you certainly don't get to hang out with your kids. You know, it's time to kiss them goodbye <laughs> and get your affairs in order. And uh, and then listen to the clanging of the of the of the cell door as it closes behind you. So what about the idea of sympathy, Tim? I mean, don't you have sympathy for ignorance? You have a piece uh, titled being entitled to your opinion is not a defense for stupidity. But when you've got the former president of the United States and all kinds of powerful, influential people in media, both corporate and independent, anybody from Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity to Ben Shapiro and I don't know, Stephen Crowder. I mean, these some of these people are very influential. They're telling folks the election was stolen. They're telling folks the FBI are, you know, leftists and and so on. And and is ignorance an excuse? Um, Well, I mean, legally, it's not, um, you know, regardless of what law is being broken. And, you know, the ignorance is not a defense from from for law breaking. Um, but particularly with this kind of law breaking, I think all that that truth that you just mentioned speaks to is the importance of holding those people at the top accountable. I don't think it's enough, for instance, to lock up the you know people that storm the Capitol if we're not going to lock up the people who encourage them to do it. I mean, they have got to be punished as well. And in fact, one of the best ways to ensure that other people don't do that kind of thing again even if they have some of the same political beliefs and the sort of MAGA ideas, but to keep them from actually engaging in terrorism, the best way to do that is to is to take out the head of the organization, so to speak, by punishing them and holding them accountable, because then they will see that not only will they potentially be in trouble, but the movement that they support at some level ideologically is also going to be broken. And perhaps they'll figure out a different way to make their political case and make their political argument. Maybe they'll try to join the, the, the ranks of normal political discourse, which would be fine if they're willing to do that. You know, Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson used to be part of that, used to try to make their points in a relatively above board and not overly, uh, you know, uh, sort of seditious kind of way, especially Tucker. And he's now gone full MAGA because it pays. It makes money. Yeah. Right. I don't believe Tucker Carlson believes a lot of the stuff that he says when he when he starts, you know, he said he's made positive comments about the Unabomber. He's made positive comments about, you know, QAnon people. Do do I really think that Tucker Carlson likes the QAnon people and would want to hang out with them? Of course not. But he knows that there are people listening. So it makes him money. He didn't used to be that guy. Ben Shapiro used to. I I remember debating Ben Shapiro in an online forum back in like 2005. He was just like a typical Reagan Republican. Dinesh D'Souza. Great example. I've debated him seven or eight times. And he was just a typical Reagan Republican. And now he's you know, starts off doing the Obama birther stuff with his film many years ago. And now he's, you know, full scale MAGA election stolen, you know, all all this nonsense that is in his latest film, the 2020 million mules film or whatever the hell it's called. Yeah, (laughs) they became that because that is what sold to that base. So the base needs to be held accountable so that the leadership and, and the spokespeople realize that if they encourage these people to do this, it's not going to help the movement. They're going to end up being punished for it. And the people at the base need to see the people at the top held accountable in some ways as well, so that they get the idea that there's got to be a different way to do what it is that they do to advocate for what it is they advocate. So I don't think we want to just hold the the foot soldiers accountable, but they don't get off the hook just because someone is steering the ship, right? If you If you stay on that ship, especially after you've seen what it does. I mean, after yeah. January 6th, if you're still on that ship and you're still engaged in this kind of incendiary, seditious, terroristic rhetoric, then you know exactly what you're doing. And so it's not about not having sympathy for people. It's not about not having compassion for people. It's about saying that I care more about the future of the country and the future of the planet than I do about, you know, some some QAnon influencers feelings or whether or not they get to live with their family for the next 20 years as opposed to living in a prison. <laughs> uh so we just had the what 21st anniversary of the horror of September 11th which we lived through and it's interesting to hear national security experts go on different shows and talk about the threat that al qaeda poses certainly a threat certainly a consideration but sure. The real threat is clearly from domestic terrorists. Uh, A couple days ago, a a man with several pistols went into a Dairy Queen and said he was there to restore 
Trump as president and to kill liberals and Democrats. And he, he didn't luckily. Well, because we all hang out at the Dairy Queen. That is the that is the place where the leftists congregate. So he, you know, clearly I mean, good, good targeting, good targeting there. I, don't, yeah. I feel like somehow you're you're out of the loop. We do, Tim. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, we've missed you at the last meeting, which got moved from yeah. Hardee's because Mike Lindell was there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're right. like, let's yes, get over to. So guy goes in, and uh, you know he's clearly been influenced. Maybe he's mentally ill, but I, we we haven't seen the uh, psychological examination. The point is, nine eleven passes, and, and and people are still trying to talk about the threat that foreign terrorists pose. But we 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 realize there is a tremendous amount of data, and even if you don't work at the Southern Poverty Law Center or you know the. Yeah, Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division, if you have an internet connection, then you can see it happens almost every day in America. Somebody gets yeah. targeted for their sexuality or their ethnicity or, yes, their politics. That was liberal Democrats. And why? Who are the people doing it? I heard yeah. on the fifth column, the kind of libertarian podcast, this guy, Kamel, uh, what's his name? Black guy. But he made this false equivalency about the the guy who went to the softball game. He was a Bernie Sanders supporter. And he shot a bunch of Republicans. I'm like, that's the last one. That's the right. last time it happened. It happens almost every day. I'm trying to make this point about the aggregate threat that domestic national, the right wing Christian nationalists pose. And I just want you to pick it up from from there and how absurd this is if you're really looking at the threat matrix. Right. Well, I mean, every single source and we're not talking about, you know, Antifa Research Department. You know, we're not talking oh, not not that they're bad. They're actually very right. good at this yeah. research. But but for people who don't want to listen to the anti-fascist community talk about where the threat comes from, you, you know, when Christopher Ray is saying it, when, when the head of the FBI appointed by Trump uh, is saying to Congress, as he has, when the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, which was created in response to 9-11 to obviously deal with that particular kind of threat. And even they're like, yeah, that's not really where the threat's coming from right now. Like we're, you know, we're keeping our eyes on it. It's out there, but this is way bigger, whether we're talking about the number of incidents that are, that are carried out, the number of plots that are foiled and so not carried out, but which they interrupt, which we also need to remember. Those were plots that could have materialized had they not been keeping tabs on them. And during the Trump administration, People that are in that administration have now come out and said, yeah, he didn't want us focusing on that. They redirected all the money or most of the money that was going to go to looking at domestic right wing anti-government extremism towards dealing with Muslims. And so so for four years, we weren't paying very close attention. And thankfully, we still were able to disrupt a number of plots. But whether it's a number of plots, a number of incidents, the number of people killed, it is overwhelmingly right wing violence. And so the idea that that that, you know, 21 years after 9-11, we still think of terrorism, an awful lot of Americans as having a brown face yeah. and being, quote unquote, foreign and being Muslim uh, is is, I think, pretty revealing. And listen, this is the kind of stuff. Speaking of 9-11, it's, it's one of my clearest memories from that day. Um, I was on 9-11. I was actually in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I was I was there for four days at the Pointer Institute, which is, you know, a journalism institute down there hmm. that we were doing like a four day seminar on race and reporting. Um, so it was a very interesting time to be there talking about those issues yeah. and how race is represented in, in the media. And um, and on the second or the third day, I think it was the second day was 9-11. And um, we all sort of were scurrying about and obviously it disrupted the flow of what we were going to do for the week. And it changed the direction of, of what we were talking about. But we got on uh, uh, Heidi Byrick, who at that time had just started Southern Poverty Law Center, was there. And she got on one of the chat boards that the SPLC, you know, sort of sneaks into and spies on Nazis. And one of those things, I think it might have been Stormfront or it was one of them. She got on the chat board using her, you know, her fake name or whatever that allowed her access and she's pointing out that one of the guys who was in one of the larger neo-Nazi groups at that time was posting that day that, you know, what we need is for is for white people to have the balls that these people that did this had. Like like his complaint was our movement just doesn't have the balls yet 
to do what they just did in bringing those towers down. That's what we need. I think I think this guy said testicular fortitude or whatever, but that's what he's saying, right? It's like, we just need the balls to do this. So for 21 years or for, for many years after that, you had white nationalists who were like, oh, look at what the potential of mass violence is, yeah. you know? Yeah, we'd had Oklahoma City at that point, but I think for a lot of them, it was this wake up call, like we can strike fear in the hearts of millions of people if we just have the balls to act in the way that these people did. So a lot of them have been planning it for a very long time. Um, and so I think it's it's long overdue for us to rethink, obviously, our conceptions of what terrorism is and what the threat is, because when we don't do that, we let down our guard and, and we're all you know, we're all at greater risk. Well, did you hear that the uh, Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is his name? Apparently on 9-11, he invoked political domestic extremism and the right went nuts. Uh, the five host, Greg Gutfeld, called that, called him out and uh, said that, uh, well, I don't know what he said. Uh, Tucker Carlson said drawing a parallel between January 6th protests and fall of the Twin Towers is true lunacy. I mean, they gave them a lot of fodder for their shows to, to scream and yell that the current Department of Homeland Security secretary took a look at the threat of terrorism on on an appropriate day and time and said what he said. I don't know exactly what the quotes were, but I mean, he he's, it's, it's, it's important that federal government is looking at the threat, but it's also important and interesting uh, that the right flipped out about it. But the point is we're talking about Timothy McVeigh. We're talking about right. the guy who killed black people in a, in a grocery store, killed Hispanic people in a Walmart. We're talking about yeah. the, the the threat that plays out every day where they could use, in fact, and they have uh, weapons of mass destruction to blow up a federal building. That is not that would not surprise yeah. anybody if any if, if someone, God forbid, did that. Right. Well, it shouldn't. I mean, it absolutely shouldn't surprise anyone because they have been planning on doing those kind of things for a very long time. I mean, sort of the Bible of this of the of the far right white nationalist part of the far right is still the Turner Diaries, which you know was written in like 1978 um, by the founder of the National Alliance, what used to be the the largest uh, neo Nazi organization in the U.S. It doesn't really function as such any longer. Um, but that book was the inspiration for McVeigh's Act, um, and you know there are. Others in the movement who still consider that sort of the blueprint for for what needs to happen in this country from bombing the FBI, which is one of the things that happens in that book uh, at the end of the book to the so-called day of the rope where all the traitors are hung from light posts, you know. Um, And so a lot of the rhetoric that you hear is is has been around for for 40 years. And the Tucker Carlson's of, of 40 years ago and 30 years ago and 20 years ago weren't paying attention. And they're not paying attention now where they are, but they don't want to acknowledge what their politic has wrought. Because let's be very clear, that terrorism is the end point of the MAGA movement. Like there's no way that you can have a politic that is rooted in demonization of the other, which MAGA is and has been since Donald Trump came down that escalator and started talking about Mexicans being rapists and horrible people and all this stuff. When you when you base a politic around othering people, when you base a movement around the not only subordination in terms of policy, but the demonization of people, where do you think that leads? It doesn't lead to peace. It doesn't lead right. to security. It doesn't lead to well, some kind of kumbaya moment. It, it ultimately will lead not not on the part of everyone who hears it and not even on the part of everyone who joins in that movement or votes for that candidate. But there will always be people who, when they hear that these are the bad guys, and it's not just that they're bad, right? It's it's that they're trying to replace you, to genocide you, to, to take your country from you, to steal your culture, your job, your home, your family, to traffic your children as the QAnon folks, whatever. If that's there comes a point where if the threat is existential, so we're not just debating tax rates now. Right. We're not just debating trade policy, different ideas about trade. We're not debating agriculture subsidies, good or bad, right? We're we're debating, are you a satanic p- 
pedophile and a yeah. cannibal. Well, it's right? in between that. And you could argue and we're not just debating more controversial or very divisive culture war issues like guns, God in abortion, because I think the most animating thing that the reason why there were terrorists at the Capitol on January 6th and, and not just the demonizing of the other side, which I think is probably the most important and animating point for for his, the history of the right. Now it's the former president of the United States and so many others saying our elections suck. They're fraudulent. They're rigged. When, in fact, the last election, of course, was the most secure ever. And, right. you know, we can shit on America in, in, in any ways that we want and be critical of ourselves and our government. But our elections are pretty damn good because the old ladies who volunteer there and so on and so forth and everybody up and down. But yeah. that more than anything else right now seems to be animating them that these lies, the uh, complete lies, the election is stolen. There's a whole bunch of new IRS agents uh, that are that are coming to take your shit. Their weapon they're They've got weapons like these types of boldface lies about what the government is doing when they're not. Right. That really animates right. people more than almost anything ever has. And that's somewhat new, I think. Well, it is it is somewhat new. And, and, and I mean, there have been iterations of that going back, obviously, to the militia movement in the 90s that was happening around the time of McVeigh. You had all the stuff about U.N. helicopters and new world order and world government and all that nonsense. But but yes, it, what is dangerous, specifically dangerous about the election lies um, are that it's not just about at this point contesting the veracity and the legitimacy of the 2020 election. What it is is really an attempt to discredit the very notion of democratic deliberation itself, right? The idea that elections are not secure, you can't trust elections, so why have them? I mean, basically, that's why this is fascism, right? Because this is about creating a movement or a mindset, right? And this is why they're all big fans of Orban and others who are these autocrats, right? Who who really, they go, they go through the motions of elections, but the idea is elections can't be trusted. The other side is always going to cheat, therefore we must cheat, to keep them from cheating because they're the cheaters. Right. And so we have to steal the election first because those awful leftists are going to steal it with, you know, bussing in brown people from from, uh, you know, Mexico City or something or Guatemala to, to vote. All this nonsense that's being said. So if you create that kind of mentality, then there's no more rules. Right. You don't have to you don't have to play by the rules anymore because you've convinced everyone the other side. Not just are they bad people, but they're stealing the election anyway. They don't play by the rules, so we shouldn't play by the rules. This is what, by the way, the Nazis did in Germany. Their whole thing was we have to sanction Jews because Jews are boycotting Germany. Right. So so there was a, a boycott called of Nazi Germany on the part of Jewish folks who didn't much appreciate, you know, anti-Semitism and the rise of Hitler. And so Jewish folks were like, we're not going to buy German goods. Seems like a perfectly valid thing to do. And then in response said, see, the Jew Germany said the Jews are trying to strangle the life out of Germany. So now we have to oppress them because they're oppressing us by speaking out against our beliefs. And so it becomes this cycle where the actual power and the autocrat uses not only the fear of the other, but the belief that the other is cheating and scheming and yeah. conniving as a way to discredit what we normally would think of as the democratic processes of elections. Why even have them if the other side's just going to cheat? Why, why, why should we ever worry about voting? Why don't we just have a dictator? Why don't we just have some friendly kind of fascism, right? It becomes easier to, to think in that way if you're discrediting the most important sort of ritual of democracy, uh, not the only one, but an awfully important one, which is the actual process of, of electing people to represent you. And then once you've discredited that, which is what I think they're obviously trying to do, um, it becomes a, a much more open question as to whether or not you can maintain a democratic system because everyone just sort of becomes so cynical about the system that then it just becomes about power and might makes right. And, well, the ballot doesn't matter. So now I'm going to go get my gun. You know, and 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 that's where the terrorism comes in, because the other ways of doing politics have now been or yeah. are being discredited. Yeah. Yeah. In so many ways, all the time on radio, podcasts, YouTube and obviously cable news. And by the way, I'm just seeing this tweet of yours. I went through, as I always do right before I interview you, you know, your last, I don't know, a couple of weeks of, of, of tweets and. And so it's just when we talk about fascism or, or Nazism, is ever a, a one to one comparison? History draws distinctions and, and we're in a different time now. And you can spread, you know, your falsity so much faster now than the good old days. But, man, 
I just saw this tweet of yours where you write, so the January 6th terrorist whose story was told at the Trump rally in Pennsylvania as an example of an unjust persecution of innocent patriots was a guy named Tim Cusinelli, and you include a picture of him. He's an open admirer of Hitler, down to the mustache, who a judge yeah. actually had deemed as dangerous. He's a bigot. No wonder Trump likes him. This is really, like, important. The, the kid... A guy, he's a grown man, uh, shaved his mustache into a Hitler mustache and then was made to be seen as a sympathetic character who is persecuted because this isn't a few bad apples. <laughs> this is this is a lot of them that believe this shit. They don't even know what maybe Nazis or, or Hitler or, or anti-Semitism is. They don't even know it, but they are it. It would seem a lot of them are it. Yeah. And the fact that that was, you know, th these Trump stage routines, these shows, these rallies yeah. are very scripted down. You know, I mean, he's not. He goes off the cuff all the time, but yeah. they're very stage managed. They know exactly who's going to be up there speaking. So when this guy's mother, this this Hitler cosplaying dude's mom gets on the stage to talk about her her baby boy and how he's being persecuted. You know, you, somebody looked into who Cusinelli was like somebody did Googled him and they saw that picture of him with the Hitler mustache and the hair flopping down in his face like Adolf and said, yeah, it's, let's tell that story. You know, let's we'll have his ma on there. That'll be great that she, she'll make she'll tell a fine tale about her, her, her brave son, the Patriot, the cosplaying Hitler cosplaying Patriot. So they, they approved that. This is the thing about know, these folks now. They approved that. You know, somebody approved of a shitty lighting scheme during Biden's speech where the cameras would only catch the red and not the blue and white. Somebody approved that. Somebody should be in trouble yeah. for that. That was dumb. That was a dumb lighting scheme to approve of. It looked bad. They shouldn't have had Marines there. That was also dumb, probably. But yeah. and Trump's yeah. team, <laughs> they approved of making a kid that dressed as Hitler and was deemed yeah. dangerous by a judge as a sympathetic yeah. character. They approved of that because they know it fucking works. Right. And even if and even if you could make the argument that this guy didn't commit a particular act of violence on that day, you still would. And if you and if you wanted to somehow believe that he's not really dangerous and maybe he shouldn't be locked up. And I'm not making that argument, by the way. But even if that were the case, like. Is that still the guy that you want to be the poster child for injustice? The guy with the Hitler mustache, like even if he wasn't even if he's just a Nazi, because, no, we don't lock people up just for being Nazis. So if that's your argument, well, he's just a bigot and he has a right to be a bigot. OK, he has a right to be a bigot. But do you do you do you put him on the poster as the example of your team? I mean, it just it you know, it seems to me one of two things is true. Either this is an incredibly incompetent group of people who were screening this or they're doing it quite deliberately as a dog whistle to certain people who were they're just going all in on this. Now, they're just sort of going all in with the with the absolute most reactionary elements of the movement because they realize they're losing others. They realize that in the wake of the Dobbs decision, there are a lot of sort of mainstream conservatives and Republicans even, and certainly a lot of people who are moderates and independents who are who are horrified by what that's going to mean for women's reproductive autonomy. So they know they're losing whatever they had of the of the center sort of rational right. And that means all they have left are these hardcore. That's why Trump the other day actually, you know, not tweeted, I guess, you know, truth social or whatever, a picture of himself with a with a QAnon pin on and a where we go one where we we go all uh, symbol. He he retweeted that. I don't think that he created the meme or the picture, but he yeah. reposted yeah. it. Yeah. So that's I mean, is the, is he really a QAnon guy? Of course not. But he knows who the base is. Yeah. You he know, knows else? his audience. That's one thing. No one can accuse Donald Trump of not knowing his audience. He's known his audience since he was about 14. And, right. And, and, and so, well and said, so you know, all it's, of that is calculated because he knows those are the foot soldiers. Those are the ones who will die for him and kill for him. And that's all Donald Trump has ever cared about. Will you kill and die for me? Because for him, it's all about that. He's this wounded narcissist who, you know, wants to be loved in a way that his own parents never did in a way that his own family never did. And so he he appeals to those people who are the most militant and the most dangerous uh, among people. And I right. think there are three other people who do the exact same thing just off the top of my head. There are hundreds more, but they are Steve Bannon is exactly like that. So oh, yeah. is Tucker Carlson. 
Uh, and yeah. and there are plenty more. They they do not want to hang out with the people who listen to their shows. That's one of the big. I think about that Absolutely. a lot. I think about that a lot in terms of this podcast that I've created. Like I've become good friends with people who listen to the show. I they they are in so many cases my teachers, my mentors, just really amazing mm-hmm. people that I, I genuinely like and respect. You think Tucker Carlson and Steve Bannon want to hang out with the fucking dirtbags that listen to their shows, much less Trump, the Trump family? Wants to go oh, yeah, alligator yeah. hunting with the people that actually show up for those hunts? No, no, no. of course not. But that's no. The, they, they, you know, it's why Donald Trump, you know, in, in a in a rare moment of candor back in 2016 uh, on the campaign trail, you know, famously made that comment at one of his rallies how he loves the poorly educated, yeah. right? And it, yeah. it wasn't a slip; it wasn't a gaffe. Like he he meant that as a compliment. He's like, "You people are stupid, but I love you." And they were all like, "Yes." Yeah, we are stupid and we love you. And he's like, see, and and you would die for me and you would kill for me. And so to him, that's the ultimate that's the ultimate high for him is to have this adulation, adulation and 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 love or what he perceives as love. What what substitutes as right, love for right. him, which well is said. either been money or applause right, or ratings. <laughs> right. Right. And, and so for him, that's when he says, I love the poorly educated. He doesn't want to hang out with them. He doesn't build hotels for them. He doesn't build like budgetel ends for them. He's not going to, they're not going to get invited to Mar-a-Lago. Right. But, but, but he gives them this sense of being seen, which is pathetic that you, that you're so desperate to be seen that being, you know, used and abused by someone like that is what, uh, you know, gets you through the day. That's horribly sad, but there are a lot of people like that. I've, I've talked to you about before, you know, during the anti David Duke work, we would see this all the time. We would see, you know, working class and lower middle-class white folks, um, who would who would not only support Duke, but in the early 90s, when the city of New Orleans um, told the Mardi Gras uh, crews that operate the floats on Mardi Gras, there are two or three old line crews that had remained racially segregated had never had a black member. I don't think they ever had a Jewish member. Um, and the city council um, said at the time, the majority of the council voted to say to them, listen, if you don't desegregate within the next year, you're not going to be allowed to parade because your activities are subsidized by the city. We clean up the trash. We yeah. provide fire protection, police protection for your floats, et cetera. Um, and these old line crews, you know, took their toys and went home for a couple of years. They rather than be told by the city what oh, to do, we would go to Mardi Gras parades and see these working class white people and lower income white people who would never be allowed to come to the crew of Rex ball. Like they're not going to be on the float. They're not going right. to be at the party. They're not going to be invited to the meet and greet. They're not going to be there, but they're standing on the sides of the road, you know, with their camouflage duck hunting caps on or whatever, with a sign that, that is a, this horribly racist sign aimed at Dorothy May Taylor, who was the city councilwoman who had initiated this, this effort against the, the hard, the old line crews a picture of her with big exaggerated lips, you know, darkened features made her out to be much blacker than she I mean, she's a black woman, but made her much, much darker and much more stereotypical looking. And it said something about, you know, she was the Grinch that stole Christmas uh, or stole Mardi Gras or whatever. And it's like, dude, you you think that these rich people want anything to do with you? But to them, there, <laughs> right. there was that psychological benefit of of seeing, you know, the David Dukes of the world stand up for them that they decided to cast their lot with these rich assholes who don't care about them rather than to realize that those same rich assholes that don't care about them are the same rich assholes that don't care about black people in new Orleans and that are screwing everyone. And, and so, you know, there's part of me that wants to be compassionate about that ignorance and wants to, to reach out and attempt to redirect that animosity. But there's also part of me that says at some point, if you're going to insist on going down that road, and certainly if you're going to engage in terroristic or fascist activity, that's when, You've crossed the line from from simply being used to being a, a very willing participant in something that's horrific. And that, I think, is the line that a lot of these people have you know, recently crossed. Uh, before I let you go, I wonder what your thoughts are. Have you I haven't seen it yet. If you had uh, point me to it. Have you taken a hard look at the. Campaign or the. And the quality of our candidate, the Herschel Walker campaign and, mm-hmm. and that situation, it is a really fascinating i mean maybe it's we've seen this over and over throughout history uh but that herschel walker is a, is a republican and, and that trump's endorsed him and he supports trump and that georgia republicans who i'm sure are overwhelmingly white are supporting this guy and that he's so close to Raphael warnock here you go two black men who've been very successful in their lives but in terms of 
the United States Senate, the office, like Warnock is eminently qualified and a brilliant guy who's by no means yeah. perfect, but nobody is. And and then Herschel Walker is. He might have an, uh, some kind of an injury. I don't know, uh, but he does not. He's, I, well, he clearly, I mean, and not not at all to make fun of it. I mean, he he is, I think, pretty clearly, as is the case with a lot of of football players um, who've been knocked around and tackled and 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 beaten up for years on a football field, and especially one that was as as accomplished as Herschel Walker was as an athlete, is going to have some some physical issues that are affecting brain function. I'm just going to say it as nicely as I can. And um, he has no business being in the Senate. He doesn't understand any of the policy issues. It's rather obvious when you listen to him talk. What's most fascinating about him as the candidate, right, is that the Republican Party and Donald Trump in particular thought to themselves, how do we beat a black guy? We got to get another black guy and black people will love our black guy, right? They'll love him because he's an athlete because black people love football players, you know, and it's like this incredibly racist idea that we got to have certainly this they'll fall for this. Black folks are not going to fall for that. Herschel Walker is going to get overwhelmingly whatever votes he gets are going to come from white Georgia and black folks in Georgia. Some are going to vote for him, of course, but the overwhelming majority are still going to vote for Warnock because they understand who actually represents their interests. They actually understand that the guy who's there right now, who speaks about policy as if he actually understands it, is the one who has their interests at heart. And Herschel Walker has spent very little time attempting to make those same connections in the black community. But white Republicans think to themselves, we got to get a black guy. Let's get an athlete. It's an incredibly racist kind of, of pivot if you think about it. Right. We got we got to get this this guy who doesn't have any qualifications which is sort of like saying any black guy will do right. And instead of, I mean, there gotta be, you know, black conservatives in the state of Georgia who would be well, qualified. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, to, to be fair, I, which I hate to think, I, I feel like this was like the, the MAGA movement Trump's pick and that they had other candidates that Mitch McConnell would have likely support and thrown money to, but they, they didn't win. You're probably right. You're probably right. And I think Trump wanted Herschel Walker because Trump has a celebrity fetish, right? Like yeah. Yeah. Trump yes. Wants, Trump, Trump wants a celebrity. He always would talk about his relationship with athletes and people oh, he like Don loves King black and, people that hate black people. It would seem right. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> he, he, he obviously likes black people who are as far from the black community in right. terms of, of of where they stand on issues as possible. But he also just loves celebrities. So if you've got somebody who's an athlete, well, that to Trump is the ultimate. Right. And I'm sure there are other Republicans. There, there are obviously Republican candidates in the state of Georgia, including black Republicans who would be qualified for the position. I wouldn't vote for them if I were living in Georgia, because that's not my politics, but they got to be there. I mean, I've met some in Georgia who are conservative black folks who would be qualified to have that position, but you can't have one of them because it doesn't tick all the boxes that Trump wants. And I think what we're going to find out after this election, if if Warnock holds the seat, and I and I, I do suspect that he will, although I think it's going to be really really tight, crazy, uh, is that we're going to see some of those Trump picks, not just Walker, but um, uh, uh, Doctor Oz. Same thing. I mean, what's Doctor Oz's qualification other than being a celebrity, right? Other than being on television, yep. other than looking like he's out of central casting, as as Donald Trump likes to say. Um, you know, Blake Masters, these 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 guys who are clearly out of their depth when it comes to policy issues that 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 the country is is uh, is facing um, is going to possibly chip away a little bit at the luster of Trump endorsed candidates. But it's not going to do that with this hardcore base, because, again, for the hardcore base, it isn't about winning elections. In fact, the more elections they lose, this is the danger. The more elections that the Trump people lose, the more it confirms to the hardcore base that elections are meaningless, right? Because uh, every time they lose, point. it's just yeah. stolen anyway. Yeah. You know? yeah, it's a great, but no, but I mean, and those are the people, the base quote, other people who've come out and vote in primaries. That's how they get these candidates because the other, right. the other people right. are, you know, not paying attention or not, are not voting. Um, I don't know if we can hear this, uh, but I, I want to try to play it and, uh, and get your reaction to it. And then I'll let you go. But this is, this is, you know, Herschel Walker the other day and what he said here, and I mean, almost does seem abusive to play him speaking publicly, but here it is. If you stop for a moment and look at our founding father when they wrote the Constitution, 
they wrote in the Constitution that every man to be treated fair. They try to write a Constitution to help this country be a, be a better place. All right, I don't think anybody can hear it, but if it look, uh, he's talked about our founding fathers when they wrote the Constitution. They wrote in the Constitution that every every man be treated fairly. I mean, it's rough. It's it's a rough thing to see a black person say that because y- you you would imagine that his ancestors would probably be appalled by by it if they could talk to him. I, I mean, mean, I I would think so. It's it's appalling to hear anyone say it, and yeah. I don't want to put any greater burden on black people to get it straight than white folks, because obviously, if white folks had had understood this, um, maybe we wouldn't have had so much of a history of of racial oppression. So I don't want to I don't want to expect more of Herschel Walker than I would anyone else, but I certainly don't want to expect less of him. And and in this particular instance, to have Herschel Walker simply misstate what the Constitution actually did and said it didn't there's nothing in there about treat everyone fairly it's not a fortune cookie you know it's 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 not a, it's not a bumper sticker right it's a document that enshrined in a couple of different places the system of enslavement you know it's a document that as soon as it was passed and ratified the very first thing that congress did after it was ratified was go into session and passed the Naturalization Act, which said only white people could be citizens of the United States. So Herschel Walker's simply wrong. Now, one can be wrong, and it doesn't make you a bad person, but if you're that wrong about something so foundational and fundamental to the country that you're hoping to represent the United States Senate, you are disqualified, in my opinion, from being in that position. You ought not be in a position if you don't actually understand the history that you're stepping into. Um, and, and he clearly, he clearly doesn't, but in that regard, he's not that different from a lot of people because most folks, if you ask them, what's the naturalization act of 1790 and why does it matter? Right. Right. Aren't going to have a clue, right? They're not going to know that that, that's not something that we're taught in history, even before the attack on critical race theory and accurate history in schools, they weren't teaching that. But if you want to be a Senator, uh, and you're making a stump speech, uh, you should, you should get that right. Uh, Yeah. Last question real quick. I'm asking a lot of smart people this. There are, I think, 50 some days before the midterm elections. How do you see the 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 importance of these elections 50 days away, almost eight weeks away? I mean, they're they're absolutely critical because I think it's pretty clear if the Republicans take back both chambers for sure. But even if they take back the House, which, you know, just mathematically, they, they probably will. Um, because there are some structural advantages and redistricting and things that help yeah, them. Um, all we're going to see for the next two years are investigations of the investigations of Donald Trump. Right. It's yes. going to be it'll it'll make Benghazi look like it was a valid fishing expedition. Right. We'll we'll mm-hmm. bring in everybody who's ever questioned Trump about anything and grill them about nothing at all and waste money and time and energy because we're not going to be able to get a lot of legislation passed if you have divided government. Um, obviously, if the Republicans also took back the Senate, it's going to be catastrophic in terms of, of judicial appointments, even beyond what's already happened. Um, and so these are really important elections. I know we always say this, oh, it's the most important election of our lifetime. It seems like every two or three or four years we say that. Um, but it really may be true in this instance. And um, I don't think it can be overstated how important it is to make sure that the MAGA movement is defeated soundly at the polls the on MAGA election movement, day. I mean, and, you're and talking about we, the- need, we need to have a respectable and valid conservative movement in this country. I'm not one that, that, that doesn't want there to be that. It's important, I think, that there be a legitimate and valid conservatism that we can listen to and, and, and debate and discuss and disagree with and hopefully defeat because I'm not a conservative, but it needs to be there. That's an important voice that people have and feelings that people have. But what we have right now is not that. That has been hijacked. That has been truncated. That has been trumped, pun very much intended, by the MAGA movement. And it's not good for the country to have that be the face of conservatism because it's not conservative. It's reactionary. It's not conservative. It's fascist. And it's 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 a dagger pointed at the heart of democracy itself. Right now, the message that I think Democrats should be should be hammering is not so much a policy directive because, you know, policy directives rally your troops, which is very helpful. 
but the other side can do the same thing and it becomes something of a stalemate. If you want to be able to really defeat the MAGA movement, not just not just win a House seat or a Senate seat or the presidency, but really defeat the movement, it's going to take building a coalition that's going to include some people that you probably are not going to be breaking bread with politically yeah. in four or 10 years or 20 years because you're going to have major disagreements. But you've got to get together and decide that saving democracy right now saving and preserving our system so that we can actually make it better as opposed to seeing it going the direction that it, that it's going with the MAGA folks it has to be the first order of business. Because if we don't do that, none of that other stuff that we want, none of the policy stuff we want, whether it's guaranteed, you know, universal health care, whether it's better schools, whatever it is, living wage, $15 minimum wage, better trade policy, whatever it is that you care about, ain't none of it going to happen. Right. If we do not preserve some semblance of small D democratic processes in this country. And in order to do that, it's not going to be something the left alone can do. It's certainly not going to be something that the center alone can do. Right. It's going to have to be something that everyone who isn't a MAGA fanatic is going to have to decide. We got to put all this other shit to the side for a while until we secure you know, the beaches, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We have to build up our defenses and then we can get back to arguing like we always did. You know, we can get back to that. But right now we have to defeat this movement because it's the biggest threat to democracy that we've seen, you know, in the last 150 some odd years. Very well said. Tim, as always, a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me so much of your time. I really appreciate you. All right, man. Thank you. Sirens teach you better stand up, stand up. Let the brave meet the challenge, let the meek weak flee. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. When you're tired of begging, saying pretty please, that's the time you gotta finally get up on your knees. When you can't see the forest for the burning trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the Kid needs you gotta stand up, stand up. I think you're driving wheels in leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep in tight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You gotta stand up, that's right. You got to rise up, you got to stand up. The devil straight in their eyes We got to let him know It's his turn to go See it clear and all you hear is a lie Go get up off of your butt Get down off of your fence yeah, Even if it ain't a very friendly audience Well, they'll begin to listen When you start making sense And you stand up Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even. They knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go. To make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show a beat 
to the voice inside. And listen well, and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says, stand.